Hello everybody, welcome to number 27, I'm Jack and today I'm going to talk to you about the Bugatti EB110. This is a video that I've been wanting to make for a really long time. This is such a fascinating story because the EB110 is the car that restarted Bugatti's first revival and it failed spectacularly. But what is really interesting is that it shouldn't have failed. It was actually the most complex, the most technically advanced, the fastest supercar of its time. Actually, on paper, it deserved to succeed, and yet it didn't. In this video, I'm going to tell you the reasons why it failed and brought a newly revived Bugatti into bankruptcy. And also be prepared because there is a bit of a sting in the tail of this story. First of all, it's quite important to have a little bit of background Bugatti was founded in Molsheim by Ettore Bugatti in 1909. Molsheim at that time was in Germany, but after World War II it was handed back to France. So it's a company with many influences because Ettore himself was obviously Italian. Molsheim was originally in Germany, but then in France. It was famous for making pre-war some of the most incredible cars in the world. Absolutely stunning, beautiful things. And I think undisputably the best cars of their time. Also, it was really, really successful in Grand Prix racing. However, Ettore died in 1947 and the company started to flounder after that. His son died previously testing a Bugatti, so there was no heir apparent. As a result, the company went into liquidation in 1952. There were a couple of stalled attempts to revive it in the 60s and I think the 70s, but the first time there was a genuine attempt to bring it back was through Romano Artioli, who was an Italian industrialist, businessman, investor, and had been really, really successful. First of all, I think he had the biggest Ferrari dealership um, in Italy, uh, amongst others, but also he imported Japanese cars, and I think he was the first importer of Suzuki into Italy. So he had good financial backing and a good track record, and he was very passionate, and it is said that it was actually also through Ferruccio Lamborghini's encouragement that he bought the rights in 1987. Artioli was incredibly passionate about this project and initially he wanted to locate the new factory in Molsheim, where it originated from. However, it was felt that it was just going to be too difficult to attract the right kind of engineers, the talent, to an area which no longer had that background. So in the end, it was located in Modena. It was known as the Blue Factory, and it was an incredibly, incredibly impressive complex. It was designed to be good for the workers, it was very advanced for the time. It's said that large parts of it had marble flooring, so no expense spared, an absolutely ad hoc building that was made specifically for this project. It was quite usual to see Artioli running around the factory in his bicycle, and it's also said that like the original Ettore Bugatti, he lived at the factory. One last example of just how far Artioli was willing to go on this project is that he managed to source one of the original doors from the Molsheim factory and he included it in the new buildings. The EB110 was launched in 1992. That's an incredibly short gestation period, especially if you consider that this car was completely bespoke. All the parts were made specifically for the 110. There was no gearboxes, no engines, no bits that were just taken from other cars. So it had a custom made 3.5 litre V12 producing 553 horsepower. It was quad turbo, four turbos, again I think a first for the time. It had five valves per cylinder, so that's a total of 60 valves. It was aluminium and magnesium. In a first for a production car, the chassis was all carbon. It had aluminium bodywork and even active aerodynamics. Top speed was supposed to be 212 miles an hour, so the fastest time, the fastest car of its time, 0 to 60, 3.4 seconds. So a devastatingly capable and quick car. Although they used a host of lightweight materials, all this complexity obviously did have one downside. The EB110 weighed 1,620 kilos. Only the Diablo VT of the time, which was the porky four-wheel drive version of the Diablo, was heavier than that. However, it didn't stop it performing and it set a lap record at the Nuremberg Ring, Nuremberg Ring 
of 7 minutes and 44 seconds, which was incredibly quick for the time. So it really sounds like the EB110 was destined to succeed, and yet it failed. Why is that? Was it the price? Was the price too high? Was it the handling maybe wasn't actually as good to drive as it was supposed to be? Or is it something else entirely? Or is there also a final twist in the tale of this one? First of all, let's look at price, and no one can deny that it was an expensive car. At launch, it was £285,000. A Testarossa, the 512TR model that was being made at the time, was 130,000. The Diablo was 143,000. However, both were completely in a different league in terms of performance and power. Perhaps the closest competitor was the Jag XJ220, and that was way more expensive at over 400,000 pounds. Soon after this was released, the McLaren F1, which we will talk about again, also came out and that was an incredible £540,000, so almost twice the price. So while the, while the Bugatti was expensive, I would say that comparatively, and if you look at what it was and the performance that it offered, it was actually pretty good value. So I don't think that price was the primary issue here. So what's the problem the way it handled? Or perhaps was it really unreliable? Well, it definitely wasn't unreliable. Still today, it has the reputation for being an incredibly reliable car, as long as they are looked after. That definitely wasn't an issue. They were properly developed and properly built. So did it handle like a bit of a pig? No, it seems not. If you look at contemporary road tests, they gave it an incredible write-up. Autocar, in one of the seminal tests that I read at that time, compared it to the XJ220 and said that it was perhaps a slightly less stable on very long sweepers, but it was much more agile, much easier to drive. Autocar concluded that the four wheel drive made this car sensationally dynamic, but still incredibly usable, and that it made more sense overall than the XJ220. Not just that, but on a mixed run, it would get 21 miles to the gallon. So it sounds really like a pretty exceptional car. There was one issue, and that is that it was incredibly compact, which I guess made it agile, but it meant that although it was a comfortable car to be in, the ride was very, very good, but that was absolutely a tiny amount of storage space. So I think you could get a custom-made briefcase that went behind the seats, but even the XJ220 actually had a little bit of a boot. Also, it was very difficult to accommodate anyone over sort of six foot. So those were definite negatives, but I still don't think that they were the reasons why um, it didn't sell as much as it should have. Was it perhaps the looks then that were the problem? And here, and here I don't know. I, d I don't think that the looks in themselves were a problem. It is a very distinctive car. I don't think that the design on a personal level, the design doesn't quite gel. It's certainly not a beautiful car. Uh, and particularly from the back, I think there are a couple of issues. But again, I don't think this would be enough to stop it being the success that it really deserved to be. So was it something else entirely? Well, at the time, there were some problems. So it was a car that was released during, unfortunately, during economic recession. Secondly, a lot of Artioli's wealth came from his imports of Japanese cars. And at the time, the Japanese yen was getting forever stronger. So that put his other business in difficulty. At the same time, it seems that he overextended himself because he also bought Lotus. Now it seemed to make sense because he needed a distribution network in the US, so he could have used that. Uh, and actually Artioli did incredible good to Lotus because it was under his stewardship that the Elise was released, which pretty much saved the company. But back to, to Bugatti. So it was released during a period which economically was very, very difficult. He overextended himself with Lotus, he, his own businesses were under pressure. And I think that for sure, this contributed to the difficulties that, um, the, that this Bugatti faced. However, this is where I think we can say that there is, you could say that it's the elephant in the room. I prefer to say that this is the whale in the closet. And that is the McLaren F1. Now, I remember when I was a youngster, I was reading about the development of both these cars in Car Magazine and in Autocar. They both had sort of in-depth editorials, interviews um, with the designers, with Murray. And it was just, I remember the whole sort of antithesis of these two cars because the EB110 
And to be honest, I think it probably does follow the, the original Bugatti ethos, just went for complexity and for more. It was a car built for more, more turbochargers, more power, more technology. Whereas Gordon Murray decided that for the F1, what he wanted to do actually, and the best thing of all, was weight. And I remember reading those articles in which he was saying, look, weight does everything. With less weight, you have more speed, you have better handling, you have better braking. That means that you can also use lighter components if there's less weight. So it's a self-perpetuating thing to a degree. And so it absolutely made sense. And I loved the way his, you know, what his thinking for the F1 just sounded incredible. Everything had to be half the weight. Even the tires made by Michelin at the time, it was prescribed they had to be half the weight of a normal tire of that size. Bugatti went the other way. And the problem is that the F1 was such a remarkable car that it didn't just move the goalposts, it almost created a completely different game. This was a car that weighed 1,100 kilos, so full 500 kilos lighter than the Bugatti. Not just that, but Murray decided that obviously the best engine would be a non-turbocharged engine. And yet, from the BMW engine, they managed to get 627 horsepower. In a car that was lighter for the Bugatti, it made for something which still today is absolutely sensationally quick. So the figures that the Bugatti had, 212 miles an hour, pretty much trounced by the F1, which was electronically limited to 231 miles an hour. The F1 was also pretty usable. It did have some space for luggage. It would seat someone over six foot without too many problems. And not just that, but it had space for not just two, but three people in a really compact package. To be fair, it did cost almost double what the Bugatti did, but it was just a completely new way of thinking. And I think that it really overshadowed what should have been a real trailblazer for the time. Now the F1 as well didn't sell anywhere near as many units as it should have. I think in its first year it was supposed to sell 300 and its whole production run, it sold a thousand. But I think it was more a problem of prestige the EB, for all the fantastic things that it was able to offer, was really a little bit eclipsed by the F1, and that made it quite a difficult prospect in an already very difficult environment. Now you have to feel bad for the people who worked on this project, because they set out to beat what at the time they thought was the leading light in terms of the supercar industry, and that was the supercar industry in Modena. And they definitely achieved that. But there was this Trojan horse, or this unexpected challenge coming from the UK in the McLaren F1, which completely redefined everything. So it's just sad to think that really, they managed to do what they wanted. This was really, this did eclipse any car that had at that point come out from Modena, and yet it still failed. It's easy to jump to conclusions and to criticise Artioli and say that he made the wrong decisions, but I don't think he did. I think this car, unfortunately, just suffered from bad timing. If you look at what Volkswagen are doing today with their versions of the Bugatti, with the Veyron, with the Chiron, they're actually quite closely related in spirit to the EB110. I think the original Bugattis followed a culture of excess, of technology, and in that way, you'll notice that VW hasn't followed the example of the F1. But what do you think? One of my friend's parents at the time was an avid supporter of the EB110, and I remember sort of discussing with him and telling him how I thought the F1 was superior. But I absolutely love both cars. I've never seen an EB110 in the flesh, and I would absolutely love to. I doubt it's gonna happen anytime soon. If you enjoyed the video, please do subscribe. If you want to support the channel so I can keep sort of advertising and product placement away, please do go to the video description and I'll put a link on there. But most of all, thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. I've loved telling you this story and I really look forward to seeing you for the next video.